Thank you students for being back in your seats. You guys are a blessing. But for everybody else, please start making your way back in here into the auditorium. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start in one minute. Thank you guys, thank you for your, for your attention to this and we uh, look forward to having you back in here in your seats momentarily. You never really know how unimportant you are until everyone in the auditorium ignores you. But I still love you guys. No, for you guys, that's right, thank you. You guys are off. You guys who are sitting down, you're amazing. You are anointed of God. Amen. For the rest of you, you have 25 seconds to prove it. So. Okay, thank you for coming back in on time. We appreciate that. Um, Dave Hinton over here has been with us for, I don't even know, it's been probably two decades, hadn't it? 23 years. How many? Since 99. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. Anyway, Dave Hinton was a friend of Charlie and Jill LeBlanc's who travel with me and do our praise and worship. And they invited him to come to our minister's conference up in uh, Buena Vista. And we just had a small group of a hundred people and it was wild. Oh. We just, we, it was a, a party and people were just really enjoying themselves. And so Dave got up to sing and while he was singing, one of the ministers came by on a stick horse, riding a stick horse. And somebody else uh, said they'd give him a hundred dollars if he got bucked off. So he got bucked off the stick horse while Dave was singing. And then he, anyway, I don't know what you were thinking. You're just wondering, what did you get yourself into? I thought this is not your normal preacher's meeting. <laughs> That's right. But to help, uh, Dave Duell called him up and prayed for him. He passed out under the power of the Holy Ghost. And while he was laying on the ground, they came up and started throwing money on him. And he was totally covered in money. So I think that helped him get over it. Well, I, I thought it was angels. I, I felt things all over my head. I thought, praise God. And I opened my eyes. I thought, I think I'll just close them for a little while longer. <laughs> Let the angels work. Amen. But I tell you, Dave yeah, has been coming with us for ever since then, for yeah. over 20 years, and people just love him. And man, you'll love his heart. You know, not everybody's country uh, or Western style, but I tell you what, you listen to his heart, you're going to yeah. love Brother D uh, Dave Hinton. God so this is Dave Hinton. Let's welcome Thank him. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, I want to take up an offering. <laughs> Look over at someone and give them a great big smile offering. Come on, loosen it up, praise God. Now look up and give the Lord a great big wave offering and a smile offering, amen. Hallelujah. Don't you know that we love to see our children happy, right? Well, I do. And don't you know God would like to look down and see us sometimes just, just happy and joyful and giving him praise? I found out something, happiness comes and goes. That don't sound right in a charismatic circle, but, but sometimes a phone call or a, a report from one place or another can, can, can take the happiness away for a moment. But the joy of the Lord is constant. Amen? It's there no matter what. And uh, boy, it doesn't matter what you're walking through. I shared the last time we were here in uh, October and I just had uh, that carotid artery worked on. And, and when they rolled me in the surgery, I, I said, hey, can I ask you a question? And uh, they, they looked over at me, but they were busy. And I said, I said uh, how do you feel about faith in God and in Jesus Christ? And they stopped and just looked at me. I said, well, let me explain. The Bible has said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I said, I don't mind some rank old sinner working on me today, but I don't want no fool touching me. <laughs> I got a little chuckle out of them. Anyway, they showed me they had some faith. I said, well, go to work. 
And you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And uh, the presentation last night was so, I don't even know, I don't have words, but anytime uh, fear has ever knocked at your door and, and that thing with death, and there seems to be a thread around the medical world that, you know, you're going to die. And I always tell this, but a doctor kept badgering me with that, you're going to die. And, and uh, he got mad at me because I maintained my joy. Hello? And I asked him, I said, why are you trying to scare me? And uh, I told him, I said, 10 out of every 10 people die. It's a proven fact. And he said, well, you're not taking this serious enough. And he said, you're gonna die, and I said, well, you are too. <laughs> and you know, just, just keep your joy, amen? If you're going through something. And uh, I, I found God to be faithful. And, and I walk through and I, I, I seek and I search and, and I stand on the promises that cannot fail. Though the howling winds of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail because I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And, and so if anything's going to come out of my mouth, I want it to be the word of God. I'll wake up sometimes and I'll, uh, I'll just bypass every other thing and thought that might be trying to come at me. And I'll say, <laughs> whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, I'll think on these things, amen? And if I have to replay that, that's fine. And, and Isaiah 26 and three says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. One thing I know is I was lost, no doubt about it. Don't have to check my list too much, but, but uh, the word of God says, while I was yet dead in trespasses and sins, Christ died for the ungodly. So I checked my list, David Worth Hinton, ungodly. Finally, I'm meeting the requirements. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, I was lost, right there, ungodly lost. And he didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinner to repentance, sinner right there. So praise God, I fit, I qualify, amen. I was playing in a bar called the Demon's Den the night I got saved. Walked out on the street and Brad Agley looked up at me, 15 years old, said, sir, you need Jesus. And I thought, well, I need something. But I didn't think a holy God wanted anything to do with me. I'd tried to be saved. You ever do that? Well, that's a heavy trip right there. Trying to be saved. <laughs> Trying to be good. I could be good for a limit two weeks. Then I'd leave my room and it'd all go somewhere else. Praise God. And, and so what, what I did that night in Nashville is I put the faith he gave me in his grace. I'd said the prayer, I'd, I'd, I'd repeated and, and done everything that everybody told me to do. But that night I put my faith in his grace, the grace he gave me, I didn't even have any. And you know, I led him into every area. My song had always been, I surrender some. I surrender most. <laughs> but that night I began to sing, All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. My heart is like a house One day I let the Savior in And there are many rooms Where we would visit now and then And then one day he saw that door I knew the day had come too soon 
And I said, Jesus, I'm not ready for us to visit in that room. Cause that's a place in my heart where even I won't go. I've got some things hidden there and I don't want no one to know. But he handed me the keys with tears of love on his face. And he made me clean. I let him in my secret place. So I opened up the door. And as the two of us walked in, I was so ashamed His light revealed my hidden sin But when I think about that room now I'm not afraid anymore Because I know my secret sin No longer hides behind that door I had a place in my heart Where even I wouldn't go I had some things hidden there And didn't want no one to know But he handed me the keys With tears of love on his face and he made me clean I let him in my secret place Have you got a place in your heart Where even you won't go You've got some things in there And you don't want no one to know well, he's handing you the keys with tears of love on his face and he wants to set you free let him go in your secret place amen thank you lord Well, I remember the night at the end of my road in a hotel in Nashville searching for hope. In my hand was a Bible I'd read as a child. On the table was a bottle driving me wild well I poured the whiskey into the glass and I prayed it would help me forget the past but then I read how Jesus died on that tree so I poured out the whiskey and I fell down on my knees. And that night old Jack Daniels met John 3.16. God's word broke the stronghold he had over me. I traded Tennessee whiskey Calvary's tree that night old Jack Daniels met John 316 all oh, now when I see those old friends I used to know down by that old place where I used They tell me I'm different than I used to be. 
Lord, and I love to tell them what happened to me. That night, old Jack Daniels met John 3.16. God's word broke the stronghold he had over me. I traded Tennessee whiskey for Calvary's tree. That night, old Jack Daniels met John 3.16. I traded Tennessee whiskey for Calvary's tree. That night, old Jack Daniels met John 3.16. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I used to be a sinner in the worst degree. About as mean and rotten as I could be. Everybody thought that I was normal till I got born again. Anybody in here born again? <laughs> when everybody saw that there had been a change, most of them thought that it was something strange. A few of them believed that I'd been hypnotized or gone insane. They said he got brainwashed. Oh, Lord, I've been brainwashed, gone over overboard, brainwashed, and I sure am glad because my brain needed washing real bad. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So just keep on washing, Lord. Amen. Now, every day with Jesus is a joy to me. I'm not as mean and nasty as I used to be. Still I'm, far, still I'm far from perfect, so I have to read my Bible every day. When I do, I know that He renews my mind. It takes a hunk of junk and makes it something fine. When anybody asks me how I got this way, I just smile and say, I've been brainwashed, oh Lord, I've been brainwashed, gone overboard, brainwashed, and I sure am glad, because my brain needs washing real bad. Now the very thing you feared has come upon you. I want you to sing it with me. All right, your part's brainwashed, here we go. I've been Oh, Lord, I've been, I've gone all overboard, brainwashed, and I sure am glad, cause my brain ain't washing real bad. I've been, oh, Lord, I've been, I've gone all overboard, brainwashed, and I sure am glad, cause my brain needed washing real bad. I said my brain needed washing real bad. I said my brain needed washing real bad. It needed washing real bad. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How many of you have to talk to yourself? I'm trying to make the time. Just, do I have six minutes left or am I that far over? <laughs> Paul said, speak to yourself. World says you're a nut if you speak to yourself. But I heard it's okay to be a nut if you're screwed on the right boat, amen? <laughs> so, um, 
And so I just want to try this because I've been speaking this to myself and uh, believe, in, believe in God for some things. And uh, I love the Word. And so let me just try this. If I, if I mess it up, just remember I wrote it, so I, I wrote it messed up. Okay, all right. So, I speak to myself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Anybody ever do that? I'm in the wrong gear, excuse me. I've got to try to do this. I need to speak it in the air. Anyway, praise God. Gosh, I could have stopped it brainwashed. Everything was going pretty good. I speak to myself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I won't let my heart be troubled by anything that's wrong. I'm troubled on every side, yet I am not distressed. But I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm happy. And I'm blessed. Amen. As far as I'm going, everybody say, I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm happy. And I'm blessed. Amen. So God bless you. Andrew, thank you for letting me come again this year. And I told Andrew, uh, he called me the second year and said, where are you at? I said, I'm up in Illinois preaching and holding meetings. He said, well, did you forget about our, our uh, minister's conference? And I said, uh, I said, I didn't know I was invited. He said, you're always invited. I said, well, you'll have to tell me if I'm, never, if I'm ever not invited. No, again. you're invited. So, so you're I'm invited. just here. You know, <laughs> let me you. just say that I've been with Dave when, uh, I don't know, at least three or four times that they said he couldn't live. And he's still here with us. <laughs> and he's... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, I remember one time they drew a dotted line around his leg and we're going to cut his leg off. Yep. And what did you say? I told him I would not be defeated. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, that was 25 years ago. He had a stroke and they said he'd never play the guitar again. Yep. And you've been seeing him play the guitar? Yep. Told him he had, his fingers were too fat to play guitar? Yeah. <laughs> He's a living miracle right here. And uh, I love you, brother. And we're just agreeing with you that God's health is flowing in your body. Father, we thank you for from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet that health, resurrection life is flowing in Dave Hinton's body. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for cleaning out all of his veins. Thank you for his circulation, for his heart. Everything is working properly, and we just thank you for sharing Dave Hinton with us. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. And if you see him stand up, you'll notice he's my little brother. Six foot seven, little brother. What a blessing. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give this morning. We've got some students with us that weren't here, and I just encourage you. Let me share with you out of Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Most of you know this verse, but it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with what measure you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And so you can determine the size of your harvest by the seed that you sow. And most people think sometimes that that's wrong to say this, but go ahead and pass out the envelopes. But this is the way that farming works. You know, if you want to reap a lot, you got to sow a lot. And sometimes it works on both sides of this. Sometimes people will see people that are really blessed and receiving a lot of money and they will criticize them. But you don't know what they've sown. I remember Creflo Dollar being here and some people had just criticized him and were speaking against him living in a nice house and flying in a plane and doing all of this stuff. And I was in the green room talking to him and he says, yeah, they don't realize. And I said, you know, I've given away a dozen cars and <clears throat> because of it, I drive a really nice car that was given to me. And he said, yeah, I've probably given away two to 300 cars. 
And then he says, and I've probably paid for a hundred people's houses and just make them debt free. And people criticize him, but when you give like that, I guarantee you, you can't help but receive it back. And so I want to encourage you today that we've got a lot of things going on here. And if you have a need, I'd like to encourage you to just sow a seed towards your prosperity because it will come back. Jeremy, would you come up here just quickly and share? Uh, he was sharing this with me and I asked him if it would be okay to ask him to share it. But um, man, he, he's uh, just recently seen this work in his life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we have. Is that on? Can you hear me okay? There you go. Um, about, excuse me, uh, let's see, it was a year, a year and two weeks ago. In our church, we do something around that time of the year we call Big Vision Sunday. And the Lord put it on our heart, my wife Sarah and I, to stand before our congregation and enter into faith together to have our property completely paid off. And we were declaring debt-free in 23 because Jesus is our jubilee. And um, we've been... It rhymes, it's got to be It's got to be true, right? I mean, (laughs) we had been in the property, on the property, about three and a half years at that point, and we had paid off about 35% of the property, which was good progress, but it left us about 65% still to go. And so if you do the math, that would probably put us somewhere between five and seven years of having the whole thing paid off, which would be good and plenty to be thankful for, but it came up strong in our heart a year and two weeks ago that we needed to um, be aggressive in our faith about having that paid off. Well, two weeks later, less than two weeks later, we're here at the men's meeting and Brother Andrew, those of you who are here, you remember this, he was given the vision for the property and the building expansion that's going on throughout the property all over the campus right now. Man, the Spirit of God just got all over me in the middle of that and said, so into this and do it now. Do it right now. So we did. And uh, it was a chunk for us. It was a very significant seed for us and one that would have made a decent dent (laughs) in our payoff. And there's a natural way of thinking that says, hey, if you want to pay something off, it's not a good time to be giving everything away. But there's, an all, there's also a supernatural way of thinking. There's, a, there's natural understanding and there's spiritual understanding. And the Spirit of God was all over us to do it. So we sowed that seed a year ago today uh, into this ministry and the expansion. And over the last 12 months, the Lord began supernaturally providing for us to pay off that debt. And we were making really good progress, really good. And then we got to a couple of weeks ago, we're coming up to our Big Vision Sunday for 2024. And I was looking at the payoff and the balance and what it would take. And I started looking at the accounts and I thought, we could do this. That's awesome. And I sensed the Spirit of God saying, you need to do it. And I I sort of sat there and thought, can we do that? I mean, we got a lot going on. We got construction going on. We've got operations. I'm telling you, Brother Andrew, it got so strong on the inside. Do it and do it now. So the testimony is one year to the day that we release faith to be debt-free, the whole church property is paid off. Totally paid for. Totally debt-free. I got so excited uh, over the last couple of Sundays Um, people are given and the offering reports are coming in and I saw it and I thought, not a dollar of that's going to a bank. That's awesome. It's all his. But when we did that and the Lord led us to pay that off that way, as soon as we did, I remembered that seed that we sowed here. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God made such a connection in my heart, showed me that what he was able to do for us over the last year started a year ago today. And the scripture says in the book of Galatians chapter six, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He said, if you sow to the spirit, you'll reap from the spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh. And you know, a lot of people mock us and people like us for for telling people you can sow into the kingdom of God and reap from it. But they think they're mocking us. They're really mocking God. That's good. And what he said was, he will not be mocked. So, 
you know, if they want to argue with you, I found the best thing to do is say, you know what, talk to the Lord about it. <laughs> you know, let them argue with the Bible. Let them argue with him and see how that goes. You don't get sucked into an argument over it. Let them argue with the word. And the word said, do not be deceived. The way I like to say it is quit kidding yourself. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And I'm so thrilled and honored with what the Lord did for us over this last year. He did it. He did it. He did it. He did it. And he started it with a seed Amen. into this ministry and into that vision. So Amen. thank you for letting us be a part of it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. That's awesome. And you know, one of the translations of that verse in Galatians chapter 6 where it says, be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. One of the translations says, that and that only shall he reap. And it's implied whether you read that translation or not. You can't reap what you haven't sown. And many people are praying for a harvest over things that they haven't sown. So when you give in the offering today, I just encourage you to really believe God that this is a seed that is going to come back unto you quickly, a hundredfold in this life with persecutions. Amen. People laugh at that, but that's what Jesus said. And you know, the persecution is a lot of it is persecution for believing that God could bless you financially. People don't like that. They don't want to get God involved in their finances and you will be persecuted. You started believing this, but I guarantee you it will work. So, Father, we love you, and we thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, Father, for all of these provisions. Father, thank you that you provide our need. Thank you, Father, that Jeremy's church is paid off debt-free, all of the property. Thank you that this, everything here is paid off. Thank you that you are concerned about our finances. And, Father, we trust these promises. And I, I just put my faith with people who are giving today. And if they need a miraculous supernatural return on it, we are releasing our faith and believing that what they have sown is going to come back to them 100 fold in this life. And Father, we thank you and agree and receive that in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. You can receive the offering. I tell you, our staff is awesome. They're awesome. They're a blessing. All right, let's turn over to Romans chapter 6. And you know, I've experienced this hundreds and maybe thousands of times, how God supernaturally direct our paths when you acknowledge him in all your ways. That was really excellent what Jeremy was saying this morning. I appreciate him following the Holy Ghost and getting off what his track was because that was just excellent. But he only acknowledge, it, it, that only works him directing your past if you acknowledge him in all of your ways. So I've experienced this a lot of times, but I'm still just amazed because very seldom do I ever know what I'm going to minister before I get up to minister. And there's reasons for that. That's not saying that anybody else who does it differently is wrong. It's just that's the way it is with me. But this week, I really felt like God gave me some things to say, and I didn't know what this musical would be like, but it was just perfectly with what God had told me to say, and then what Jeremy's sharing and everything. It just seemed like this is divinely ordered of God, and I believe that the Lord has a purpose. He's trying to get some things across to us. And uh, boy, some of the things Jeremy said today about uh, identity, I thought that was just excellent. So after this meeting, I'll pinch all of those things and tell people this is mine. God told me that. <laughs> it was really, really good stuff. But here in Romans chapter 6, let me just read some of these verses because there's so much in here I can get bogged down with it and I want you to at least read it. And then we'll be, I'll come back and comment on this this morning and also tomorrow. But in Romans chapter 6 verse 1, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if you have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we, also, we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Man, it's hard for me to quit reading because this is just so powerful, but I do want to comment on some of these things. So let me stop there. But let me start by saying, he says, what shall we say then? The word then means that this is dependent upon all of the other things that he had said in the previous five chapters. And I hadn't got time to go back and summarize this, but man, Paul, uh, Romans is Paul's masterpiece on grace. He had been attacking this mindset that God loves us because of some virtue that we have, because of our performance. And he had been showing that it was totally by grace and uh, he had made that point so conclusively. In the fourth chapter, he showed you that Abraham and David, two of the greatest examples in the Old Testament, it wasn't their goodness. You know, if people would really use your brain for something besides a hat rack, when you read the Bible, you would find out, did you know that Moses killed a man thinking he was going to bring God's will to pass? And he wrote the first five books of the Bible and also Psalms chapter 90. David wound up killing his lover's husband trying to cover up his sin. He was a murderer and he wrote most of the Psalms and all of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings. Uh, a lot of things is written about him. Saul was the one that converted to Paul. We saw that uh, musical last night. And he's the one that wound up killing uh, Christians, persecuting them and giving consent even to their death. So what this means is the majority of the Bible was written by people who are murderers. <laughs> and yet people don't make this connection. They think that you got to be holy and you got to do everything right before God can move in your life. It's just amazing how you can miss this. The Bible is so candid, so clear about the way that it presents people. Man, it shows you that God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. God doesn't use us because we're lovely. He loves us because he is love. And so it's clear. And so anyway, he'd been making these points. And because of that, and he was showing that God doesn't love us based on our performance. Well, then a logical question is, are you saying that we can live in sin? Because religion basically tries to motivate people not to live in sin by telling you that if you sin, God won't answer your prayers. God won't use you. God won't bless you. And there's two extremes to this. The ultra Pentecostal will say you lose your salvation every time you sin. And if you die before you get that sin confessed and under the blood, you'd die and go to hell, even if you've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. A lesser interpretation, but it's like a stick or something. It's just the other end of the stick. It's still the same stick. You may not go to hell, but God won't answer your prayers. He won't fellowship with you. He won't use you if there's any unholiness in your life. Both of those are wrong. And this is what Paul has been saying, that it has nothing to do with your goodness. Your goodness doesn't make God love you more and your badness doesn't make God love you less. God loves you because he chose to love you, not because there was anything of worth and value in you that made you uh, valuable to him. It was his value. It's just he chose to love us. Man, I'm not going to take time to turn over there and read it, but if you read Ezekiel chapter 16, he's reasoning with them and he says, you were like a child that was born and your navel wasn't even cut and you were rolling in the dirt. You had been thrown in the dust and I found you polluted in your own blood. 
And yet you were precious to me and I took you and cleaned you up and made you my own. There was nothing in us that made God love us. When the Bible says that he loved us, he loved us because he's love, not because we're lovely. And so this is the point that he's been making and it brought up this question. Well, then why live holy? Because most people, the only reason they live holy is so that they can earn something from God so that they can get a prayer answered or be used or, or do something like that. So that's the reason. And he says, what shall we say then? Did you know that he said this in Romans chapter 3? He said it in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He said it in Romans 6, 16. I didn't read down that far. And then twice in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul, as he preached the gospel, constantly had to ask this question. Can, am I saying that we can live in sin? And the answer to it is God forbid. In the Greek, this is as close to profanity as you can get without blaspheme in some hour or another. It's an absolute, unqualified negative. No, absolutely not. That's not what he's saying. But here's the point. If you never have this question come up, can I just live in sin because God's not dealing with me based on my sin? If that question never comes up, you haven't heard the same gospel that the Apostle Paul preached. And sad to say, most of the church body today has not heard the same gospel that is the power of God to set us free. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And most of us haven't heard a true gospel. We've heard some things about Jesus coming, dying for our sins, but it's tied to your performance and to your goodness. And anytime you do that, you have polluted the whole thing. Anytime you tie your goodness to God's moving in your life, then you have polluted the gospel. The gospel means good news or literally, I, I could go into more explanation, but in my opinion, I believe it means the nearly too good to be true news. You mean that God would use me even though I'm not usable? Even though I'm not a, a great person and I don't have talents and abilities and I hadn't done everything right? That's nearly too good to be true, but that's what it is. You know, I heard a story about a man one time that his son wanted to go see a movie and uh, the other kids from the church wanted to go see. And so anyway, he came to his dad and says, could I go see this movie? And he says, well, what's it rated? And he says, well, it's R rated, but it's just a little bit of nudity and just a little bit of profanity. And all of the other kids from the church, their parents letting them go, uh, can I go? And he said, no. And in order to compensate for turning him down, he says, you can, come, you can bring those kids over to our house and you can play at our house. So anyway, they came over to his house. They were in the backyard playing and he made some brownies. And he, he brought these brownies to the kid and called them all to the back door. And he says, hey, I made some brownies. Anybody want them? And man, everybody wanted them. And he says, but before you eat it, let me just tell you that I put a little bit of dog poop in these brownies. <laughs> There's not much. You aren't going to be able to taste it. It won't hurt you. Everything is fine. You'll be able to survive. But there, I just wanted you to know there's a little bit of dog poop in here. And did you know what? None of the kids would eat it. See, anytime you mix your, your poop, <laughs> this is why we have a men's advance. You can't, <laughs> you can't say things like that when women are present. And those of you that are bootlegging this gospel, watching it right now, uh, you can't criticize me because you aren't supposed to be here. Amen. <laughs> But anytime you miss, mix your goodness, it's like putting your poop up against God's and it pollutes the whole thing. It has to be 100% total confidence in Jesus and not in yourself. And if you are mixing your holiness in there and thinking, God, you're using me because I've done this and this and this. Or if you're saying, God, you can't use me because I've done this and this and this, then you have perverted the gospel. So man, I could preach another hour on that. That's the first verse. And if you, if you haven't heard something that is so good about God loves you and he wants to use you and it doesn't matter whether you're living holy or not, that it's all based on Jesus. This is why we pray in the name of Jesus, not in your own name as Jeremy pointed out really well. If you, if you never have this question come up, do it, can I just live in sin? 
Well, then you hadn't heard the true gospel. The true gospel will bring that question out. But the answer to it is an absolute unqualified negative. God forbid. And then in this sixth chapter, he gives two reasons why a believer doesn't live in sin. It's not so that you can earn the favor of God, not so that you can keep uh, the things of God and keep God pacified and off of your case. He says the first reason right here, he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You are dead to sin. And with most people, this just does not communicate because they look at their life and they think, man, I can sin with the best of them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> they think it's not, I'm not dead to sin. I, I can still go out and sin. If I was to just let myself go, I could do all kinds of things. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Keep your finger here because I'm coming back. But look over here in 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3. And in verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And again, most people, when they read something like this, they just have a disconnect. They aren't bold enough to sit there and say, well, the Bible must be wrong. But they can't see it in their life, and so they just say, they, they just disconnect. And it's one of those things where they don't explore it. They don't continue to say, God, show me what this is talking about. The only explanation that I've ever heard, I've never heard anybody else teach on this verse. I'm not saying that I'm the only one, but I've, it's rare. I just have never heard anybody else teach on it. The only way that I've ever heard this tried to be explained is they say, well, this means you won't habitually sin. In other words, you might have been a drunk, you might have been a drug addict, you might have used profanity, you may have been into sexual sins, and you might sin occasionally, you might sin a little bit, but if you're truly born again, you won't habitually sin. You eventually will overcome the drug addiction, you'll overcome the alcoholism, you'll overcome your lust and things like this. If that's how you try and define this, well, then you have to put sin into categories. But did you know that the Bible puts gluttony right there next to adultery, murder, everything else? Gluttony is a sin. And did you know that you can't get fat on one meal? It is habitual. You habitually sin if you're overweight. You know, yesterday I ate at least twice, maybe three times what I normally eat, and I gained a pound. But you know, I could, I could eat until I pass out, and I wouldn't gain more than two or three pounds. You can't get fat overeating one time. If you are overweight, which I'm not trying to condemn anybody, I'm overweight, I need to lose, I don't know how much, it's been so long since I was there, but I know... I've got some weight that I could lose. I'm not condemned. I'm not condemning you. But I'm saying if you are overweight, you habitually sin. So if you're going to interpret this as this means habitual sin, well, then that would mean every fat person, every overweight person cannot be born of God. Are you willing to stand by that? Certainly that's not what this is talking about. You know, the real simple answer to this goes back to identity, what we've all been talking about here. The only part of you that is born of God is your spirit. Your body is not born of God. Your soul is not born of God. Now, it's got a promise that your body is going to be changed when we see the Lord. You've got a promise that we will know all things, even as also we are known. But that hadn't happened yet. Your body and your soul are not saved. But your spirit is is saved and it is born of God and whatsoever is born of God can not sin. His seed remains in him. He cannot sin. Your spirit cannot sin. So put this back with Romans chapter six, verse two. The reason we don't sin is because when you got born again, your new spirit that you receive from God is dead to sin. It can not sin. 
Your nature has been completely changed and you do not have a sin nature anymore. And again, most people struggle with this because they're looking in the physical realm. Most of us are what the Bible calls carnal. Many people think carnal is just a terrible word to describe, a, I mean, a person that just hates God. Well, a person that hates God is definitely carnal. But did you know carnal just means of your five senses? You're controlled and dominated by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you are only looking in the physical realm, you're what the Bible calls carnal. And it goes on to say in Romans 8, 6, that the carnal mind is not subject to God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, which is another way of referring to being carnal, cannot please God. If you are only trying to see, what does it mean that I'm dead to sin? And you're only looking in your physical actions and you're searching your mental part. You're never going to understand this because your body and your soul are not dead to sin. But your born again spirit is dead to sin. It cannot sin. There is no desire for sin in it. And so he goes on to say in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This is not talking about water baptism. I'm not going to take time to explain this, but Hebrews chapter 6 says there's multiple baptisms. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and he was talking about suffering. This isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about when you get born again, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 12, I forget the verse, it's around verse 13, says that the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. When you get born again, you get placed into the body of Christ. That's the baptism that it's referring to. And when that happened, you died to sin. Man, I've got a lot to say and it's not hard, but it's contrary to what all of us have been taught. And because of that, it just raises so many questions that to deal with all of these questions, uh, it's hard to make progress. But let me just say that when you, got, when you were born physically, you were born with a nature that was separated from God. You were born with a fallen nature. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. When you were born as a little tiny baby, your spirit was separated from God. That's what the word death means in the Bible. It doesn't mean cease to exist the way that we use it. It means separate. When Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit didn't die. It was still there and it was functional, but it quit being in union with God and it started operating independent of God. And in the day that they ate of that fruit, they would die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And if you look it up in the Hebrew, it literally says, in the day you eat of the fruit, you shall die, die. That word, Hebrew word is repeated just to emphasize that it is absolutely certain the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. They didn't die physically. They didn't die mentally and emotionally, but their spirit became separated from God. When a person dies physically... James chapter 2, verse 26 as says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So the Bible defines death as when your spirit leaves your body. It's not ceasing to exist. It still exists. It just is no longer in this physical body. So the point I'm making is that death just means separation. And when you were born... Physically, you had a dead spirit that was separated from God. It still functioned, but it was functioning actually in union with the devil. If you go on down to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You were born with a sin nature. Man, I'm trying to hurry up, but I know that the things I'm saying, this is revelation to some people. This is baby stuff. This is stuff that every person ought to know, and the average person doesn't know this. Just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize the fifth chapter five different times in the last seven or eight verses of the fifth chapter of Romans. It says, as by one man 
Sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For by one man we were made guilty. By one man judgment came. By one man condemnation came. It is not your individual sins that separated you from God. I know some of the things I'm saying, people are thinking, what are you saying? Oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> it's your sin. Did you know in the book of Romans, there are 49 times that the word sin or sins, plural, is used. And out of 49 times, there's only one time that the Greek, there's three different Greek words used. And only one time does it refer to something you do. 48 out of 49 times, it's describing your sin nature, not your actions of sin. 48 times the word is a noun, which describes a person, place, or thing. A verb describes the action of a person, place, or thing. And there's only one time that the word sin was translated from a Greek word that was a verb. The other times it's talking about your sin nature, it's not your sins, your individual acts of sins that separated you from God. It was the fact that we were born with a sin nature. We were all born separated from God. And the reason you sin is because you had a sin nature that taught you how to sin. It propelled you to sin. And if you understand this, it has many, many different uh, benefits to it. One of them is if you think, well, I haven't sinned as much as anybody else. If you understand what I'm saying, it doesn't matter how little you've sinned. If you are a sinner by nature, you're separated from God. And who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? <laughs> We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you have lived a great holy life and you're taking pride in what you've done, all you've done is restrain some of the actions, some of the manifestation, but you hadn't changed your nature. You are by nature a sinner and you must be born again. And on the other hand, if you've been a terrible sinner and if you've lived a terrible life, some people think, how could God ever do anything with me? There's no difference between the person who's gone out and murdered, raped and plundered and me who has never said a word of profanity in my 75, I'll be 75 next month. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I have lived a super holy life, but I had a sin nature that had to be taken away. And there is no difference between the person who's murdered and plundered. Now, in the natural, there's a difference because you'll go to jail for those things. I'm not, I may not be punished by man. I may get along with people better because I'm not going out and always offending people. But in God's sight, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. Even though I've never gone out and committed adultery and I've never done a lot of these other things, I have broken the law. It's like if there was a big glass in front of you and me, it wouldn't matter if you shoot a BB through it or if you break the whole thing, run a truck through it. If the thing is broken, it's broken. It's a whole thing's got to be replaced. God's standard is perfection. And if you weren't perfect, well, then you need a savior. And even if you have learned how to restrain your actions of sin, your sin nature is what separated you from God. And your individual acts of sin was just you indulging that sin nature. I didn't indulge it as much as some people did because I was brought up under so much fear that God was going to send me to hell. I used to have a reoccurring dream that I had smoked a cigarette and that I got turned into the cops and the cops turned, turned me over to my mother and I woke up in hell, burning in hell because I had smoked a cigarette. And that was a reoccurring dream. I had it two or three times a year for a decade. I know some of you think, well, I'm weird. I am. That's what religion will do to you. So religion scared me and it says that the fear of God restrains the amount of sin. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. And so fear can cause you maybe not to do it, but it didn't change my nature. Just because I didn't do some of the stuff that other people did didn't change my nature. I was by nature a sinner. But when I got born again and when you got born again, God took that sinful nature out of you. You do not have a sinful nature anymore. 
and he put within you his very nature. And you are as righteous and holy and pure as Jesus is in your spirit. And that born again spirit, the part of you that is born again, can not sin. It has zero desire for sin. It hates sin. Therefore, if you are still struggling with sin, it's because you haven't seen your new identity. You aren't walking in what Jesus has done. You have been trapped by what has happened to you, what your old man did. Let me, man, I'm talking as fast as I can. In verse five, it says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's a done deal. When you got born again, you were baptized into his death. Your new born again spirit is dead to sin. And if that is true, that you have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be, notice that the first part, it's done. It has happened. But then we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. But verse six says, knowing this, you've got to know something in order to experience this. When you got born again, you were created a brand new person and you are literally dead to sin. It is impossible for your born again spirit to sin. It has no propensity to sin. It doesn't have any, it cannot sin. Man, that is awesome. But it's not going to manifest in your thought life and in your actions unless you know something. It says you have to know this, that your old man is crucified with him. This is what Paul was referring to when he says Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was crucified with Christ. You've been crucified with Christ. Somebody says, well, I don't know that I have. If you're born again, you have been crucified. You are dead with Christ. You were baptized into his death is what it says up here in verses three and four. It's already a done deal. You're born again. Man is as perfect and holy as it's ever going to be. You just don't know what you've got. You haven't known this. So the first thing is you got to know this, that the old man is crucified with him. Some people teach, well, yes, that happened, but it resurrects every day. And I got to die to myself daily. There is no resurrection power in the devil. There is no resurrection power in your old man. Your old man does not resurrect every morning. You do not have two natures. You are not schizophrenic. Many of you look at your life and think, oh, yes, I am. Because, man, sometimes I want to serve God and sometimes I don't. No, that's not true. And, man, I don't think I'm going to talk fast enough to get over to Romans chapter 7. But I could explain that to you. That's anyway. <clears throat> no, you don't. <laughs> There's other people that we want to let minister. But your old man is gone. You are not schizophrenic. You know, the only reason that you still struggle with sin, it goes on and says this right here. It says uh, in verse 12, I read that, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Some people think I can't help it. You can, or he wouldn't say, don't let it happen. And you know how you let it, you find out what you've got and who you are. You find out your identity and you realize, hey, that's not me. I'm a born again person. I'm a new person. I don't have to be that way. And then it's, it goes on to say, neither yield your members. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you if you understand these things that I'm talking about. But if you go ahead and think, but I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And Jesus, I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to live this way, but what can I say? I'm just an old sinner. You're identifying with it. And therefore you may give token resistance, but if the desire continues, then you just give in thinking, well, after all, that's who I am. I'm an old sinner. It's just like Jeremiah, uh, Jeremy was saying about Saul saying, who am I that for you to be saying these things? God had to give him another heart. Did you know God has given you another heart? You are a brand new person on the inside. And the key to the Christian life is recognizing that's not me. I am dead to this. 
And I'm not only talking about the terrible overt sins of, uh, you know, dipping and cussing and chewing and going with those that do. I'm not talking about only that. It includes that. But just your persona that, well, this is, you know, everybody in my family, we just don't show emotion. We don't, uh, you know, we're just mean kind of people. We're just real abrupt. We're real critical. Well, you're trapped by that stuff. That's not the new you. You got another part of you that is identical to Jesus, that is as forgiving and loving and caring as he is. You can read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. That's talking about your born-again spirit, your nature. Your born-again nature produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Some of you think, well, I just have a short fuse. That's just the way that they are in my family. Well, you're describing your carnal self. You aren't describing your born again self. You're living out of the flesh and you cannot please God. But you could identify with who you are in Christ and say, I am dead to that. Maybe everybody in my family is mean and critical and they gossip and do stuff, but that is not the born again me. I am dead to that. I will not live that way anymore. So you have to know this, that the old man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the body of sin? Did you know when a person dies, as I quoted that verse already, James chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. When a person dies physically, their spirit leaves, but did you know it leaves behind the body? And for a period of time, that body looks alive. I actually have been with people who were dead and I didn't realize they were dead at first because I thought they were just asleep and then I found out that they were dead. You leave behind a body and for a period of time, matter of fact, I had a friend of mine that worked in the Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, the hospital where John F. Kennedy uh, was pronounced dead and he, he did aut autopsies on the 13th floor. And he called, pulled a guy out of a slab and put him on a stretcher and he was getting ready to do an autopsy. And he turned around to get his instruments and when he turned back, this guy was sitting up and his arms were dangling like this and his eyes were open. And my friend nearly jumped out the 13th floor window. It scared him so bad. He went running down the hall and yelled and somebody came in and they checked this guy out and he was dead. But did you know that even after you're dead, your body has these electrical impulses and it can make a muscle contract. And this guy just sat up. Anyway, they checked him out. He was dead, didn't have any brain waves, didn't have a heartbeat. And they just pushed him back down, and did the autopsy. <laughs> but for a while, you can look like you're alive. So your old man, that sin nature that was separated from God and lust for sin and lust for all of this wrong stuff. It programmed your brain how to think. It programmed you to be afraid of death. It programmed you to be selfish. It programmed you to think that if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. It programmed you that when you have a need to hoard and hold back instead of doing what Jeremy was talking about and giving. You were taught by that old sinful nature the wrong way to look at everything and it left behind a body, a way of thinking. And the only reason that you still are dominated by sin, worry, fear, anxiety, and on and on you could go is because you haven't renewed your mind. Your spirit is completely changed. Your spirit doesn't have any fear in it. Your spirit trusts God 100%. Your spirit can believe for anything. Did you know faith is already something that is one of the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 23, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. You've already got faith. I've got a teaching out entitled The Faith of God. Every one of you have the measure of faith. Romans 12, 3. There aren't different measures. Every one of you were given the faith of Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He didn't say I'm living by faith in the Son of God. If that's what your Bible says, you ought to get a real Bible. It's, it says I live by the faith of the Son of God. If there's only one measure, Romans 12, 3, and again, I know that the nearly inspired version says that I live 
that every person has a measure of faith, but the King James, the one that Jesus used, it says <laughs> that you were given the measure of faith. There's only one measure, and if Paul's measure was the faith of the Son of God, then you've got the faith of the Son of God. In your spirit, you have the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but it doesn't work until you renew your mind. It's got to flow through your mind to get into your physical body. And so if you're thinking that, well, I know that faith works, but I just don't have enough. I don't have any of it. You've got the faith of the Son of God. You've got everything that you need in your spirit already. But see, your old nature, that sinful nature that was separated from God, taught you how to think wrong, taught you how to be pessimistic, taught you how to see the worst side of everything, and you are going to continue to function the way you were programmed until you reprogram this mind. And I tell you, one of the greatest things that you can ever learn is that you, as the born-again part of you, is now dead to sin. It cannot sin. It's dead to that. It's dead to fear. It's dead to timidness and shyness. It's dead to worry and care. That is not your born-again spirit. Anytime that you come up and say, man, I'm just so depressed, you've solved the problem. Somebody's thinking, well, what did that solve? Because your spirit can't be depressed. You're in the flesh. You're indulging your feelings and emotions, and you're going by the way the old man programmed you. In the spirit, man, you are righteous, and you're bold. It says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, that the wicked flee when no man is without, but the righteous are bold as a lion. If you aren't bold, it's because you aren't walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. You're going by how you feel. In the spirit, your spirit doesn't know any fear. Your spirit's not afraid of anything. You are dead to all of this. So you've got to know that the old man is dead so that that body, the wrong thinking that it programmed you with might be destroyed. And then the result of that in this sixth verse is that you will not serve sin. Man, this is power. If you could understand, brothers, that you are dead to Whatever your problems are, finances, health problems, emotional problems, relational problems, anything that you're dealing with, it's only affecting your physical body, it's only affecting your mental, emotional part, but your spirit, man, is perfected forever. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14, you've been sanctified and perfected Forever. Somebody says, well, maybe I got born again that way, but I've messed up since then. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, once you believed and you were baptized into his death, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That means vacuum packed. When you sin as a Christian, it will give Satan an inroad into your physical body to affect you. It'll give Satan inroad into your mental, emotional part to change your thinking. But your spirit, this part of you that is holy and pure and you got a brand new nature, it's vacuum packed. Sin doesn't penetrate the cell. Your spirit retains the same righteousness and holiness that you were born again with and it never changes. And so the second reason that he gives, man, I'm just running out of time, but the second reason that he gives in this chapter he says it again down here in verse 15. After he had said all of these great things about your dead to sin, he says in verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And again, the answer is God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So the second reason, the first reason is you're dead to sin. And if you were to live in the spirit... And if you knew, if you had the right identity and knew what had happened to you, you would just naturally not yield to sin anymore because sin is deadly. Sin is depressing. Sin is not fun. Sin is bad. So if you really knew what you had, you'd quit living in sin because living in holiness is better than living in sin. But the second reason he gives is that if you yield to sin, then you are yielding yourself to the author of that sin which is Satan. Satan's the one that comes against you to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so if you yield to sin, you're giving Satan an inroad into your life. And he's, he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
If you give Satan the opportunity, if you yield to sin, he's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. For those of you that don't know that, you can't graduate from Carries without knowing that phrase. And so I don't yield to sin because number one, my heart's been changed. I got a brand new heart and I, I cannot sin. But then also, even beyond just my relationship with God, if I yield to sin, I'm yielding myself to Satan. And even though God's not going to impute that sin unto me, Satan will. Satan will hold my sin against me. And if possible, he will use my sin against me. If you were to take what I'm saying and say, man, Andrew says that I can't sin and that it's all grace. And so you know what? I'm going to go out here and rob a bank, get a million dollars, and they can't do anything to me. Well, no, God's not going to reject you if you're truly born again. God won't reject you for robbing a bank, but I guarantee you men will, and they'll put you in jail. And while you're rotting in prison, you could just have a wonderful communion with God because he still loves you. He's dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit, but that's just dumber than a hammer for you to go out and live in a way that gives Satan an inroad into your life that's going to cause you and other people problems. As much as you can, you need to have self-righteousness so that you can relate to people without hurting them and reaping rejection and stuff and also so that you can keep the door closed on the devil. So as much as you can, you need to live a holy life. But when it comes to God, you can't approach God on the basis of your holiness. You have to approach him only on who you are in Christ. I use this verse already, but John chapter 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you approach God, you have to approach him on the basis of what Jesus did for you and not what you've done. He's a spirit. He sees you in the spirit and in the spirit, you are righteous. You got a brand new nature that is dead to sin. And in your spirit, you're as righteous and holy, as pure as Jesus is. Because Ephesians 4, 24 says, put on the new man, which after God was created in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit is created righteous and holy. And God looks at you and he sees you perfect. There is no sin in your spirit. And if you're going to truly connect with God, you've got to worship him through that spirit, through this born again spirit. But does that mean that but since, you know, we're clean in the spirit that I can just go live however I want to? You aren't only spirit. You've also got a body and you've got a soul. And if you yield those things to the devil, he's going to come and sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Now, see, that rhymes, so that's got to be God. <laughs> and you do not want to live in sin. So living in sin is stupid. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid, because he's not looking <laughs> at your body and your thoughts. He's looking at your spirit. And in the spirit, you're a brand new person. The scripture says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't walk with God unless you start thinking about yourself the way he thinks about you. He sees you a brand new person. He sees you righteous and holy. He sees you. He said that if you believe on him, the works that he did, you will do also and even greater works than these. Jesus is expecting you to do everything he did and even greater works. And that's not for the super saint. That's for every one of us. How can you walk with him unless you agree? If you're going around just focused on your physical, natural limitations and stuff, you aren't going to really be in communion with the Lord the way you should. Now, I am not denying that we have all kinds of hangups in our physical body. And God loves you based on who you are in the spirit. He doesn't love you based on your physical realm or your mental, emotional part. But he loves you so much that he's concerned about your physical body and your mental emotional part and he wants to set you free. And that's what these verses go on to say. Man, I wish I had time to go into more detail on this, but let me show you here in verse seven. He that is dead is freed from sin. It didn't say you're free. It says you're freed. There's a difference between being freed, F-R-E-E-D, and free. You could be freed and not free. Did you know Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves? 
And yet many of them stayed in slavery for another couple of years because their masters wouldn't let them out and they couldn't break out of that. But they had been freed. Many of them weren't told that they had been freed. They didn't have the communication and the things that we have. And many of them didn't know what had happened to them. Kind of reminds you of Christians. That we don't know what's happened to us and we're still identifying and thinking, but you don't know who I am. You don't know who you are is what the problem is. You've been freed from sin. And it goes on to say in the next verse, verse eight, now if we be dead with Christ, which we are, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's future tense. Verse nine, knowing. You got to know something that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. You, you don't have to die to yourself over and over and over. You have to appropriate it over and over and over. You have to constantly keep it in mind. But you died when you got a new nature. God took out of you that sinful, evil nature. And if you are born again, you don't have any part of your spirit being that is corrupt. It is perfect. It is pure. It was created in righteousness and true holiness and the rest of the Christian life is just renewing your mind to what you've already got. You got three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit's perfect. Your spirit's the same spirit is gonna be a million years from now in eternity. Your spirit's not gonna get changed. You have the spirit of Christ living on the inside of you. This spirit is perfect, but you got two other parts. And if your mind is over here controlled by the physical realm, so that you're going by what you see and what you feel and what people say about you and what circumstances say, then that's two against one. And that just stops the flow of who you are. But if you get your mind renewed, Romans chapter 12, verse two says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. You get your mind in agreement with your spirit. That's two against one. And your body just has to manifest the resurrection power of God, the joy of God, the love, the peace, all of these kind of things. Your mind is the deciding part. Proverbs 23, seven, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your spirit has been changed. You are equipped with everything you need, everything. There is nothing that you will ever run into that you have to go to God. And he says, oh, I didn't see that coming. He's already put within you everything that you will ever need. The supply was created before the need even existed. Your supply that's in your spirit is greater than the sickness that you're dealing with, the poverty that you're dealing with, the depression, fear, discouragement. Yes. What you have on the inside is infinitely greater than whatever's fighting you on the outside, but your life is going to go the direction of your dominant thought. And if you don't know who you are and if you don't stay focused on it and walk in the spirit, then even though you have all of this life and power of God in your spirit, it will not manifest and you can live a life of sickness, poverty, fear, worry, bitterness, hurt, pain, on and on it goes, if that's the way you think. But I'm telling you, if you could receive what I was trying to get across this morning, that you are dead to sin. You've got a new nature. And now it's just as simple as as quickly as you can change your way of thinking and begin to identify with who Jesus made you to be. You can, you can uh, demonstrate that resurrection life flowing through you. Man, what I've said here is good news. This is good news. Praise God. So we've got some awesome things planned for this afternoon. Mike, you want to come up and share with them? Uh, many of you don't know Billy Epperhart, but Billy is our CEO. And I tell you, this is one anointed guy. Uh, he's not only got the physical, natural, financial stuff, but he's spiritual at the same time. And uh, you need to come here, Billy, if you haven't heard him. It'd be a real blessing. So I'll let Mike share with you about what's happening here. Hallelujah. Can you guys hear me? Testing one, two, test. Can you hear me now? I feel like I should have a Verizon phone. Um, <clears throat> so guys, uh, we've, we've getting a lot of, uh, of spiritual food. Now it's time to indulge in some natural food, amen? 
It's time to eat, and, and men can eat really good, can't we? All right, well, praise God. So we want to remind you that if you have a meal ticket, that the meals will be ready for you. Uh, if you did not purchase a meal ticket, we are out of the meal tickets for now. But you can go to the kitchen, you can go to the cafe, you can still order food in there. And, and I believe uh, you're going to be blessed. Guys, at 1.15 and at 2.15, as Andrew had just mentioned, we're going to be having Billy Epperhart. He's going to be sharing with us on finances. So you are, are not going to want to miss the miss that. It's going to be a great time where he gets really practical as well as theoretical. It's not just the theory, but it's also how do you put it into practice and how do you grow wealth for kingdom principles and kingdom purposes. So you are not going to want to miss that. At 3 o'clock from 3 to 5.30, we have our ping, our ping pong and cornhole. And then at 3.30 to 5.30, we have guided tours here at the facility. So if you have not been here before, it's a great opportunity to really look around. So we're going to pray for the food and we're going to dismiss so we want you all stand up. <clears throat> Guys, just like Pastor Jeremy said, do you feel the momentum building? Do you feel things being disturbed in your heart and being, being transformed? I know that many of you...